Okay, welcome to Peeling Sid Barrett. This will be episode 21. And in this episode, I'd like to discuss the song Terrapin, which is the very first song off of Mr. Barrett's first solo album. Uh, I'm not picking it because it's the first song on the first album. I think from this point on, I'm just going to kind of skip around to whatever I feel like talking about. So up to this point in time, I've tried to go through very... Uh, very orderly through Mr. Barrett and Pink Floyd's songs and discuss them in turn. But from now on, I think I'm just going to kind of skip around and break this off into two separate kind of directions. One will be a discussion of uh, Mr. Barrett's songs and other pieces of uh, art that he's worked on that are combined or not. And the other direction I want to go is influences of Mr. Barrett. And that will be possibly people he influenced or people that influenced him or perhaps people he may have worked with. Who knows? So in this episode, I want to cover the song Terrapin, which is one of my very favorite songs that Mr. Barrett made. It is a very simple song and it's very easy to learn on guitar. And in fact, if you're interested in learning guitar, uh, and I'm not good at guitar by any stretch of the imagination, believe me. I only started working with guitar about a year ago. But <clears throat> this song is so simple and it's such a rewarding song that I feel very strongly that it's a good starting point for someone that wants to learn how to play guitar and learn how to play songs. It can be really frustrating to try and play songs that you hear and not even come close to what they sound like. So this was the first song that I was able to kind of put together with some directions from certain people. And uh, I can't remember who they were. I think one of them was Anyone Can Play Guitar, something like that. And this song he kind of called out and I, I, I followed along. It made sense. It was easy enough to play. And it was a rewarding kind of an experience for me. Rewarding enough that I wanted to keep playing guitar. Now, there are very, very subtle things going on in this song. So, in my opinion, this song is very much like a haiku. I do wonder if it's so simple because Mr. Barrett actually wanted other people to participate in in the process. Uh, almost um, almost like a haiku so people can make haikus and they seem very simple but to do it in a very poetic fashion where you remove any extraneous things and find only distilled forms of words that are related to one another can make it look incredibly simple and perhaps even simple-minded but if you're participating in that process or if you recognize the process that's happening you can see that it's actually extremely insightful and poetic and in this way if you examine this song this song it to me is very much like a haiku it's a very very simple song but it couldn't be any simpler and you could add things to it but you wouldn't be adding to it in a way so <clears throat> it has it has a very rewarding melody. It has simple guitar. The poetry in the song, and we'll discuss that in a moment, the poetry is is equal parts simple but also very well selected. Th those aspects of the song make it, I, I think, kind of the reason that he chose the song to announce a new way of making music. Uh, perhaps he was making music this way for a long time, but at any rate, there were a lot of people that were involved in the generation of this album. Obviously, Mr. Barrett put together most of the songs, but he did work with Roger Waters and David Gilmour on this first album. Uh, we've already discussed why they may have helped or why he may have needed them to help. Uh, obviously, they, they were all under contract to some company. Mr. Gilmour and Mr. Waters were kind of still with the old group, so... Uh, you have to wonder why are they helping each other unless you know they really get along i mean there's only so many reasons why you would be helping him either because you feel sorry for him or because he's an old friend and you want to help him or 
perhaps because no one else wants to help him, or perhaps you're required to help him, and perhaps he's required to have you help. And uh, there are other people that are involved in the generation of this album, and one of them was an uh, ex band member of, I believe, the Joker's Wild, which was David Gilmour's old group that had been touring in places like France. And I can't name all the people that were involved with this, but obviously there were quite a few hands on this album. I would like to point out that I, I believe I saw an interview with Mr. Gilmour discussing the, the generation of the title, The Madcap Laughs, and he distinguished, and, and I'll include that link if I can find it, he distinguished between his intent with Madcap versus Madman, and how, in his opinion, a Madcap is kind of a, a jokester or a little bit of a troublemaker, whereas a Madman is a little bit more negative connotation. And people apparently have said that it was kind of a mean-spirited name. I don't really get it. I think Mr. Gilmore uh, very aptly named this, this album, and it's funny to me how many times... I've seen discussions with Mr. Gilmore, and I've I've thought that in some ways he's very similar to Mr. Barrett, and that he's understated, but he's able to capture very, very significant yet subtle things in his observations and analysis. So, although he consistently says that he doesn't really understand Mr. Barrett, and they didn't have much discussion. In some ways, I think he may have been the one that understood Mr. Barrett the most out of everyone in the group. Just my opinion there, but uh, I'll throw that out there. So let's take a look at, uh, like we normally do, some corrections from previous episode. And that was about Jug Band Blues. If you haven't watched that, I'll suggest you watch that if these corrections are interesting to you at all. So there are a number of things, a couple things that I want to discuss about this uh, really quick. And before I do that, I just want to um, give a shout out to Mr. Sudarshana for, I guess you could say, giving me a little bit more energy and more enthusiasm for doing the work. Because as I've said before, you know, uh, really not getting a whole lot for this. So the only thing I really get out of this is is the enjoyment, uh, the the intellectual exercise, I guess, to some degree. But also, if other people enjoy it and it's helping other people or perhaps giving them things to think about, then it's worthwhile. So if, if that's something that is, uh, is helping you in some way, then I, I hope that it does. And if you want to make comments, then please go ahead and make comments. It lets me know that people are, are interacting and... I guess you could say kind of internalizing and considering the discussions. So let's discuss a couple things. One is we discussed the moon extensively last episode because it features prominently in his song Jug Band Blues. And I didn't really go into the moon a whole lot. I just want to point out the difference obviously between the sun and the moon. The sun being largely considered to be material happiness and earthly happiness and the moon being more of a spiritual or artistic form of development subconscious development. One of the things I pointed out were the two columns in the moon and in the very old tarot card for the moon, the, the two columns. But I will like to point out in the modern Rider Waite moon, there are the two columns and, and we referenced how they may be kind of pointing to the Kabbalah. And I just want to point out that if you look at the moon columns, the one on the left is more curved than the one on the right. And that, of course, would be a more feminine feature than a masculine feature, symbolically speaking. So that kind of backs up that argument that that would be representations of the Tree of Life in Kabbalah. Because uh, on the left-hand side is, is the female side, and on the right-hand side is, is the male side in Kabbalah. Uh, another thing I'd like to kind of point out is the trail of the moon leading off into the mountaintop. So in a way, you're passing through the subconscious to a form of wisdom. Uh, through reflection, which is a dream kind of a thing, a dream idea. And as we mentioned, uh, of course, now this is all just my opinion, but uh, within, the, within the form of context, you can kind of ex understand what may have been relayed. We mentioned that he said that he doesn't care if the sun doesn't shine, 
and he doesn't care if nothing is is mine. So that is a a very definitive correlation that's contained within the tarot. And if if Mr. Barrett was considering in that in that instance, then he may have been considering it and many other things, and may have been quite interested in that. Uh, one other thing that came up was the idea of being dressed in red. And I didn't really go into it a whole lot, but there are many, many cards, and they are often tied with royalty, uh, that tie in with the idea of the color red. And we discussed that a little bit with Julius Caesar and some other things, but I, I would like to point out that there are many cards in the tarot deck that feature kings and queens that are garbed in red. Now, alchemically speaking, this, this idea of red representing an ascension of some kind is contained within Serlo's Dictionary of Symbols. And I guess I'll just discuss one aspect of it really quickly. Alchemically, he discusses the idea that the series of colors, black, white, red, and gold, denotes a path of spiritual ascension. And it's on page 56 of Mr. Serlo's book, at least the one I have. So alchemically speaking, uh, black, of course, being a color of the earth, um, white, I'm not fully certain exactly. Al alchemically, it's, it's, it's representational of mercury, and then red is representational of sulfur, and finally gold, which is the ultimate state of alchemy. And of course, alchemy, the idea is you turn a, a stone or some other form like lead into gold. And uh, some people believe that literally, and some people obviously believe that that's just a metaphor for perhaps developing a person spiritually. So red is close to being a spiritual ascension, but it's still tied to the earth. So, and again, red is a color of blood. So there are many, many um, references to the color red being dressed in red. Perhaps uh, it's a representation of the king of the earth. And uh, I would like to point out that the magician who is supposed to represent a person in the tarot system is cloaked in red. There was a reference to a cloak uh, in, geez, I can't remember the song. He has a cloak, but it's a bit of a joke. It's red and black. You've had it for months, etc. Uh, I'll put the name of the song there, but there is a red and black cloak on the magician in the tarot deck. So there is another reference to red. So. Not only is it perhaps a color of earthly kingship and sacrifice, it's tied obviously to the idea of sacrifice. Uh, for that reason, it may have been tied within the Catholic or Christian church to the idea of uh, Christ and perhaps kingship in that way. I don't know. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people depending upon the direction that they choose to look at it. So. That's kind of the ideas that I wanted to discuss a little bit further. And so I guess let's go ahead and take a listen or a look to the song Terrapin, which as I mentioned is, is the first song that I learned how to play. Now, uh, since I can play this song, I'm gonna go ahead and try and, and play it for you. And I don't know how it's gonna go because uh, it's just a one-time take but it should be good enough for us to have a form of the song to listen to. So in a way, this will be a cover of it. I'm probably going to make mistakes, but that's all right. And in a way, I wonder if all the mistakes that were included in Mr. Barrett's album weren't deliberately included because it's supposed to be a representation of a process. So let's go ahead and give it a try. And hey, whatever happens, happens. How about that? I wouldn't see 
that's pretty much it. So, uh, some mistakes in there, and I don't know, that's the basics for the song. But it's a really beautiful song, it's a really happy song. And it is kind of a true blue form of a song, I guess you could say. So for that reason, I find it to be a very uplifting kind of a song. Now, if you would, go ahead and pull up the lyrics or whatever else. Let's look through them really quickly, and we can kind of discuss what he may have been discuss, uh, discussing within the song. And uh, I realize I played the song, so maybe now they're going to take it down, or they may say that, uh, that they may block this song or block this episode, which is a bit bothersome. They may also uh, choose to cite it and take any money from it, I, which is fine with me. Like I said before, I really don't care about the money. So let's go ahead and take a look at the lyrics and see what we've got. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things to me is that in the very beginning, he rhymes the word you repeatedly. So love you, mean you, above you, and then crystal blue. Okay. So that looks like kind of an idiot is making a poem. <laughs> Uh, except for the fact that it's a little bit funny because he says he loves someone and then he says he means you and it's still incredibly vague so <laughs> it's it's a little bit of a joke and it's kind of funny now if he knew exactly who this was meant to be for and that person was a uh, was perhaps in on the joke, then they would recognize who he was referencing, but of course nobody else would. I would like to point out one other thing from the previous episode that we did with Jug Band Blues, which was that we, we, we discussed the Blue Room, and I, I didn't discuss, I did, I did in other instances, like the, the Moon card of the old tarot deck, that the lady that's being sung to is blonde. In the blue room, again, there's a blonde. So uh, I, I may throw that picture in there again. But any at any rate, uh, we've discussed the nature of the color blue. I want to point out that the most important word in those first two lines is the word crystal. And the reason it's important is because, poetically, it fits perfectly. It has the L sound of blue. And it has the ST sound of star at the beginning of the line. You could, you could choose any kind of adjective to describe blue, but he has specifically chosen the word crystal. And that proves that he has ability with poetry that is not something that is very common. He has a very uncommon way with words and poetry. And it is easily overlooked. So he discusses his hair being on end about someone, which is a very beautiful way of presenting that idea. The next line is very important. He says he wouldn't see this person, but he loves to see them. Now, why wouldn't you be able to see someone? We've already discussed the, the, the idea that perhaps he uh, is limiting himself, but perhaps also someone is potentially getting married. So that's another possibility. I'm not saying that's what this is about or that's what happened, but uh, let's remember the name of the song now. We'll come back to this. The idea of a terrapin. And uh, I'll come back to that symbolically here in a minute. But the idea that he wouldn't be able to see someone that he loves to see. Now, there's a mention of flying. Again, there's a mention of flying above you. Now, obviously, he can't literally fly. This is perhaps... Uh, a form of spiritual ascension. It is perhaps a reference to meditation or perhaps psychedelics. Perhaps it is a a discussion of dreaming, dreams of flying, which are very, very common. Again, hairs on end. So <clears throat> the, the next bit about floating and bumping noses, etc. have to do a lot with, let's say, uh, being a fish so of course in the next line talks about fins being luminous so uh <clears throat> very cool and calm and peaceful ideas and then right after that he talks about a clown having fangs which is a very strange thing to discuss and i'll perhaps give some 
uh, some discussion about the idea of what a clown can represent, but um, it, the idea of a clown is quite often tied, this is per Sirlo, tied to the idea of the inversion of a king or uh, a substitute for a king. And so kind of a twisted form of a king. And there are various cultural kind of discussions about that, but I would also like to point out that for some people, uh, a clown can, uh, especially kind of a vicious form of a clown, can also perhaps be representation of, of a fear or danger, and also uh, the hidden dangers of the world. Uh, there's also then this odd rhythm line, which we've discussed before about Dark, being dark below, a boulder's hiding all, and the, but the sunlight's good for us. That line is incredibly strangely worded, but it has a very intriguing rhythm to it. Uh, so there's the sunlight that's hidden from us, and it's good for us, but there's a, but I guess we're down below in the darkness. Now again, that could be perhaps a spiritual reference. I don't know. He mentions that everyone's a fish. All we do is move around etc etc and from that point on it's really just a repeat of those lyrics now what possibly could be meant by this song uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. again he could just be putting together interesting word combinations or looking to express an idea perhaps that's uh, kind of tying up the idea of what it's like to be alive and just kind of wandering around in darkness like a fish, uh, bumping noses with people, etc., but not really being in the sun or attaining something bigger. Now, what that has to do with this other person, etc., it's not really clearly stated. So it just kind of gives a feel for the fact that this person really loves someone, but they're tied to the earth and doing what they can, etc. And perhaps not really moving on to something together that's above or beyond who they are. A little bit of a kind of a bummer idea, but there it is. It's tied in there. So there's a form of, of love, but also of resignation and perhaps depression that's tied within this song. So we said we would discuss the idea of the title Terrapin. Now, the first thing I want to discuss is the nature of the symbol of a turtle. A terrapin is, is a, a small form of turtle. And uh, for many people, and I, I personally very much like uh, turtles for some reason ever since I was a little kid. They're, they're kind of very slow, plodding things that are tied to the earth, very peaceful. Uh, harmless things and they live a long time so if you consider all the things that a turtle means to you and the way it moves the way it looks what its shape is what it does then you can kind of break down the symbolism for you and obviously every person has a different internal symbolism for everything that they know now if you were uh, a kid perhaps that was bitten by a turtle at some point in time, you're going to have a different symbolism tied to the idea of a turtle. But uh, I, would, I would think a lot of people uh, perhaps uh, have very similar ideas of, of what a turtle is. So, uh, per Sir Lowe, a turtle often can represent a uh, female. It can represent the earth. Um, female based on its shape, corresponding uh, to, to women. Uh, I won't get into that too much, but uh, that's a, a kind of a cultural belief, apparently, that's referenced in Serlo on, uh, what page is this? Page 353. So he discusses the idea that it's, it's tied to perhaps uh, the feminine aspect. It's often tied to the earth because it's tied to the ground. It's also tied with water. Uh, it lives a long time, so it's tied to the idea of of long life and it's also very very slow and for that reason it uh, can kind of represent being tied to the passage of time and the earth 
so let's see. And here, and in short, then it stands for turgidity, involution, obscurity, slowness, stagnation, and highly concentrated materialism. Again, there's that idea of materialism, <laughs> not necessarily materialism, money, and those things, but the idea of material existence, uh, kind of a uh, a collection and coagulation of liquid material things in a person's life or in their mind, etc. It can represent all those things. So, what is the tie to Mr. Barrett? Well, we've already discussed that he was kind of of a mindset to make uh, art related to paintings. He did make two wonderful terrapin etchings. I, I believe they were etchings. I'll include portions of them here. Obviously, they're copyrighted, so I, I, I can't just show the whole thing, even though I'm going to discuss them. Uh, per my understanding, anyway, I can't, which is pretty bummer, because I'd really like to discuss them thoroughly, but I'm not going to be able to do that. So what I'm going to do is show as much of them as I can, uh, perhaps just one uh, a quarter of, of what we've got, and that should be enough to kind of give an impression of what I want to discuss. Now he did two of these, I'm only going to show one, and in both of them he, uh, I, I guess they're called soft ground etchings on paper, and this is page 190, from page 190 of the Barrett book by Mr. Uh, Beecher and Mr. Schutz, and I'll give the information for that here. I would like to point out that it's pretty rough uh, the lines of the turtle are very interesting to me. I'm just going to run kind of from maybe the upper right hand corner down the back a little bit to show the difference in shading. And I also want to point out, if you'll notice, the difference in thickness of line so that it gives it a three dimensional feel. So the, the thicker lines are located at higher points on the turtle's back, uh, the terrapin's back. And and the dark, the darker shading also gives a feel for which side is lit and which side is dark. This seems like a very simple thing, but it's not an easy thing to do. And he does it very, very well. There also is a, I guess, pen uh, ink on paper that, uh, that he made of two boys. I won't show both of them. I, I understand that these are to friends of relatives of people that he knew or something like that but I, I will point out again the interesting use of dark areas heavy lines and white lines and I think uh, these are shown on 202 and 203 of Mr. Barrett's book I will show just a portion of the one on 203 to show the darker uh, the darker shading and also the heavier line use that seems to be a bit random but it is not so for example you'll notice that the heavier lines of the glasses the upper lip uh, the shoulder to give a break in form uh, the the collar of the shirt the shading under the arm etc and uh, this seems uh, again, if you look at it just from the outside, it, it can look really rough, but it is very attractive to the eye. And there is, of course, someone who became very famous for using a technique very similar to this, named Mr. Warhol, who is considered to be a probably the first modern, um, let's call him a pop artist. I guess that's what they called him. And uh, I'll... I'll give you one of his uh, works of blotted line and watercolor. So Mr. Warhol kind of became famous in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. He did pop art. In other words, he did art to sell things and his blotted line technique became pretty uh, well known and well regarded in various magazines. I don't know what they are, but uh, <clears throat> he did a, a blotted line watercolor of a hot dog if you'll notice, I'm just going to show a section of it. You can see that he has deliberately used a heavier line to separate at points and that the closer line 
has the heavier blot and the farther away line is a thinner blot which is not done accidentally it is obviously done to generate space or a three-dimensional effect uh, there is of course another painter uh, who is one of my personal favorites who used uh, lines of solid color to separate form and that's Mr. Van Gogh himself. Now I will show a painting of some sunflowers in a yellow vase, vase or vase, I don't know, whatever. And you can see that the the solid line of color around the vase separates it from the, the table or the table and the background. Um, which is something that he kind of, I don't know exactly when he started doing that, but he may have picked that up from uh, from looking at a lot of, of Japanese art and uh, woodblock prints. So I'll show a flowering plum tree. If you look at the brown trees in the background, you can see that he has separated them in form from the surrounding area with solid black lines, which of course is not how a tree looks, but it is a way for our eye to pick up on separation of forms that normally would just only be uh, able to be separated on color, which sometimes is a little bit hard to do. So Mr. Van Gogh obviously uh, did that. I don't know if other people did that before him or not. That may have been in kind of an innovation that, that he put together and uh, people just kind of picked up on over time and started to use. At any rate, it is a wonderful... Uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing, I would say, way of painting and putting together um, putting together works of art. Now, to finish up, uh, and the the Sid painting, I'm going to try and include a Sid painting that I made uh, in in full. N I'm going to include also a discussion on blotted line technique. If you're interested in that, you can check it out. There's a couple different things uh, on, on YouTube. YouTube has so many videos of, of interviews with artists and stuff. It's really pretty cool to me. So um, one of the interesting things about blotted line technique is that you use a photograph often and then you trace it and you create a work of art from it, a, a blotted line, kind of a watercolor. Now, that is a derivative form of potentially a derivative form of art in other words you're using a photographic setup that someone else came up with perhaps you made it on your own in which case you don't have to worry but uh, obviously there are combinations of objects from different angles that are interesting people can photograph them if you utilize that and uh, generate a blotted line from it that's derivative uh, same way that if you make a cartoon from uh, an image that someone else makes it's derivative how much of it is derivative and whether or not that's transformative is entirely open to discussion and that's just my opinion but it's a really slippery slope to start thinking about if you actually <laughs> try to navigate that it's it's just ugly and I really don't like it I almost feel like uh, if you're going to reinterpret anything then it should be allowed but I don't know who am I now the last thing that I want to kind of discuss is uh, a poet we're discussing poets and so I will I will include this discussion of Baudelaire and I have uh, Le Fleur de Mont, which is a collection of his poems. And the only reason that I have an interest in him is because of uh, Jim Morrison, actually. So I read about Jim Morrison, and he expressed a devotion or interest in Charles Baudelaire. So I got Le Fleur de Mont. And uh, I have reservations about reading poetry in the non-native language, obviously, because it's translated and any form of poetry that's translated will be reinterpreted and will be missing aspects of the original language. So I am a little bit 
uh, reluctant to do this, but um, I guess even the translated forms are so wonderful that it's really hard to avoid considering uh, the, the imagery and the word combinations that are presented, even in a translated form. So I'll just give you one. This is uh, this is one called uh, Le Plante d'un Icare, or I, I'm not exactly sure. I don't speak French very well. Icare, Le Plante, Le Plante d'un Icare. I don't know. That's how I would say it in in, in French Spanish combination, whatever that would be. So, who on a trollop sets his love is happy, satisfied, and free. My arms are broken utterly for having clasped the clouds above. Thanks to the flaming galaxy that fills the farthest skies with gold, burnt blind, my eyes can now behold only the suns of memory. In vain I sought with feeble wing to find the limits of the sky. Beneath a huge and fiery eye I feel my pinions weakening. And beauty's victim I consume, nor shall I know what glory is, and give my name to the abyss that soon will serve me as a tomb. Uh, this book, I would suggest to anyone to read. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. And if you are able to read and understand French, it probably would be even more rewarding to you. I've chosen this poem because it reminds me a lot of Mr. Barrett. I don't know necessarily that this is something that he would have read, and there are a few words here that perhaps he used, but the associations uh, in feel that I have for this poem and for Mr. Barrett are definitely in line with one another. So I thought I would throw it in here and perhaps give you something else to consider. So that's pretty much it for episode 21. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please remember to give a share, a subscribe, and a like. It helps with the algorithm to get the word out about this. I, I do think that considering these things, as I mentioned, learning to play guitar, making art, uh, learning about art, learning how to express ourselves, and considering things like our own spirituality and our, and our own dreams, that's a very rewarding thing. It's a very human thing to do. And I feel in the modern world, a lot of those things have been taken away from us. Just in my lifetime, when I was going to school, we had more time and money invested in the development of things like music and art. And uh, for a while, I was a teacher. And that was like 20 years ago. And even as I was a teacher, I saw that it was reducing. And now it's really bad. Just in my opinion, the lack of application of humanities to, to people's lives. So we have to find kind of a way, I suggest, to do it on our own. And one of the ways that you can do it, if you're, in, if you're not into art and you're more into music, uh, perhaps you have a gift for that, I don't know, or, or more interested in it anyway. I, I'll, I'll give you two, two groups or two groups of music or whatever that you can look at to learn how to play guitar. One of them is Sid Barrett and this album in particular, The Madcap Laughs. The other band that I think you could really get into is The Velvet Underground and Lou Reed. And Lou Reed, uh, just just music now, just considering the music, he delves into a lot of adult topics as well. But the guitar, the rhythm of it, and putting that together with music, and as, as we mentioned, Andy Warhol, right, the, the first pop artist, he's the guy behind Velvet Underground. There are kind of some ideas that seem to be, I don't know what you would call it, coincidentally, common between Velvet Underground and Sid Barrett, uh, like Iggy the Eskimo and then the song that Mr. Uh, Lou Reed wrote. Uh, I can't remember the name of the song just offhand, but it discusses uh, someone being from Alaska and being kind of cold. So, I, I, you know, you wonder if those two things are related. You'd have to know exact time frames and 
for a lot of these songs you don't know exact time frames so it's really hard to know but that's it for today hopefully you enjoyed the episode and I'll talk to you later